welcome everyone to the Cincinnati room. My name is Zachary Tressler. I also go by Helen. I'm a second year student at Case Western Reserve University studying international studies and economics with I think minors in art history and French now. It's a long, confusing process. Uh, and again, warm welcome to be here today. We got three lovely and amazing panelists coming up. So I think without further ado, uh, to do, we're going to be introducing our first one, which is Zimu Lu, uh, junior at Oberlin College here in Ohio, who's going to give us our first presentation. So round of applause whenever you're ready. Um, so thank you, everyone. My name is Zimu Liao. I'm a junior at Oberlin College. I'm majoring in mathematics and economics. And today I'll be talking about controlling for the impact of unconventional macroeconomic policies during COVID. Do shadow federal funds rate and fiscal policy matter? Um, so first, I'll introduce the theoretical framework we're going to be working with. And here, um, I'm major using um, the vector autoregressions bars in this uh, paper. So um, one of the major tasks for macroeconomists is to uh, predict and forecasting macroeconomic variables such as unemployment and inflation. And in 2001, Stock and Watson published the paper Vector Autoregressions to assess how well VARS addressed the two tasks of macroeconomists, data description and forecasting. And they concluded that VARS had proven to be very powerful and reliable tools. So uh, what exactly is a VAR? A VAR is an, an equation and variable linear model in which um, each variable is in turn explained by its own lag values plus past values of the remaining a minus one variable. And here, um, this is the model that Stock and Watson used in their paper. So we can see here that unemployment explained by its own lag values and also the lag values of inflation and the federal funds rate. And this is the model I'll be using throughout the paper. Um, so uh, first, I'm going to say if this bar like holds using the data um, before the pandemic, and um, to conduct tests on bar, those tests are only valid if the stability condition of the bar holds. Um, and when I say the stability of the bar system holds, it means that the model is correctly specified, and we're not. Uh, emitting any variables in our regression. And to check if uh, the bar is stable, we have to look at the inverse roots of the characteristic AP AR polynomial. And if they're less than one, then we have a stable model. Um, so we first start by measuring the standard bar, uh, the one introduced in Stock and Watson, using data from 1984 to um, 2019, before the pandemic. And we will rerun the model with newly available data on inflation um, from the pan a COVID pandemic. And we find that uh, when we including the COVID period, the stability condition of the bar no longer holds. And here um, are the results of the uh, models. So uh, here is the result um, of the data from 1984 to 2019. And we can see um, from the slides that all the roots are less than one, which means that this model is correctly specified, like the like values of um, their own variable plus the like values of the other variables um, constitutes a valid regression model here. But however, uh, when we include data from later periods, uh, up to, uh, after the pandemic, um, the model no longer holds. And uh, the question we're going to ask here is what has gone wrong here? Like what has changed that makes this model no longer to hold. And so the first theory I'm, go I'm going to propose is that the federal funds rate is not a valid indicator of the monetary stance. Since, um, since December 2008, the federal funds rate has been near zero, so that lowering it further to produce more stimulus has not been possible. Consequently, the Fed has relied on unconventional policy tools such as quantitative easing and forward guidance to try to affect long-term interest rate and influence the economy. So um, given this, we can assume that the federal funds rate no longer like summarize the effect of unconventional, unconventional monetary policy. So uh, I'm going to use another measure to substitute for the federal funds rate, which is the shadow funds rate. Um, they're proposed by Wan Sha in 2016, 
and they will like convert all the effect of the unconventional monetary policy into this one measure so we can use it in our regression model. Um, and plugging in the shadow funds rate instead of the uh, federal funds rate, still we cannot get a valid bar as the root is above one. So the shadow funds rate is not a successful fix. Um, so we have to consider alternative fix to the model. And here I'm proposing the omitted variable. Um, as we all learned in macroeconomics, um, given the large scale of fiscal policy during COVID and the fact that it has been recognized since Keynes that zero lower bound can increase the case for fiscal stimulus beyond what would be warranted if the zero B is not binding. So a variable controlling for fiscal policy may be needed in, uh, in our bar in order to address the omitted variable bias. So here I'm going to include the fiscal policy into our standard, into the bar and to see if this fixed the problem. And as it turns out, it does, as we have all the roots below one. And this data set includes from 1984 up till 2022, which includes the COVID pandemic, where we have a zero lower bound problem. So this leads to our next question is that, um, does physical policy matters only when the zero lower bound is binding? Uh, here is the data um, on the federal funds rate since 1984. And we can see that um, before 2007, we don't really have a zero lower bound problem. We only have that since um, the Great Recession and the COVID pandemic. So I'm going to split the time set into two. Um, first, it's before 2007, where we don't have a zero lower bound issue. And we are going to run our bar, including the fiscal policy variable, and to see if that variable has any effect. And we're also going to run another bar um, after 2007 up till uh, 2022 and to see if the fiscal policy variable matters in our regression. Okay, um, so this is the results of the bar from before the pandemic. And here we can see in the table that the fiscal policy does, is not really statistically significant. And so um, when we don't have a zero lower bound on um, the like, the theory that fiscal policy matters in macroeconomic, uh, like affects unemployment or um, the inflation, it doesn't hold. However, um, if we see the results of the bar uh, when the zero lower bound is binding during uh, the Great Recession and the COVID pandemic, and we can see in a table that the fiscal variable is very highly statistical significant. Hence, I conclude that the um, fiscal policy matters only when the zero lower bound is binding. So, and here's a quick summary of all we did. So first we uh, used the model borrowed from Stock and Watson showing that the standard theory equation bar is only stable when we measure the data set before the pandemic. And after we including the pandemic into our data set, the bar no longer holds and the fix using shadow funds rate doesn't really help us here. So I'm proposing another theory which is adding fiscal policy to the model to see if that catches up on the dynamic. And it does, fiscal policy does help us to get a correct dynamic between all those macroeconomic variables. And um, by further uh, using, like dividing the data sets into two parts, uh, when we have a zero lower bound issue and when we don't, we can see that fiscal policy is only effective when, there, when the zero lower bound is binding. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for those for that incredibly insightful presentation. I'd like to take a moment now to introduce today's discussant who will be with us for the next five minutes before going to off of the next two presentations. Just pulling it up, give me a second. Is none other than Adam Oshkin, a junior coming in all the way from the great state of Massachusetts who at Emmanuel College. Adam, if you wanna take it away for me. Awesome. Thank you very much for the introduction. And hello, everyone. My name is Aldo Moshagan, and I'm a junior at Emmanuel College in Boston. And I'm majoring in economics with uh, minors in data analytics and computer science. And I'll be graduating in May 2024. And I'm attending this conference as I thought it would be a great opportunity to gain experience presenting while also learning how to analyze and critique others' work properly.
So firstly, I'd like to take this chance to thank the author for their fantastic work in bringing this topic to our attention, as well as the conference organizers for providing me with this opportunity. So from my understanding, the main objective of the author in this paper is to explore whether adjustments to the federal funds rate, which has been bound to zero since December 2008, and the inclusion of fiscal policies can produce a stable vector autoregression for VAR model that incorporates unemployment, inflation, and the federal funds rate for a time period that includes 2020 and beyond. As a refresher, the VAR model is based on the assumption that each variable in the system is influenced by its own past values and the past values of all the other variables in the system. So essentially, the more variables, the more description, the more descriptive the explanation. And the author's, the author's motivation for this research is due to the fact that while the VAR model used to explain the macroeconomy from 1984 to 2019 remains stable, the same model extended to 2022 becomes unstable. The author's goal in the paper is to understand why this instability occurs. And the author does an excellent job of explaining the unconventional methods used, such as quantitative easing and forward guidance, which are monetary policies used to promote economic stimulus when the federal funds rate is bound to zero. The author also suggests that excluding fiscal policy from the original model was bound for failure as the initial reaction to the COVID-19 outbreak reduced the economic output of the U.S. and billions of dollars were pumped into the economy to keep it afloat. As a result, the original model with three equations and three variables becomes unstable as it does not account for the significant increase in government spending that occurred between 2020 and 2022. To address the issue, the author proposes a four equation, four variable model that incorporates both fiscal policy and a shadow federal funds rate. The inclusion of these factors enables the model to provide a more accurate description of the macroeconomy, particularly during periods of unconventional monetary policy. This research has led me to wonder, how many variables and equations could be added to the model to enhance the accuracy of macroeconomic predictions further? The findings suggest that the shadow federal funds rate is a good measure for unconventional policies and emphasis on the importance of including fiscal policies in the model when binding zero lower bounds is another result of the analysis that can be used in future research. The research highlights the importance of accounting for fiscal policies and unconventional monetary policies when the developing models to predict macroeconomic trends, particularly during times of economic crisis. To conclude, the research provides valuable insights to the complexities of macroeconomic modeling and the need for ongoing adjustments and refinements to these models to account to, for changing economic conditions. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to any questions you may have. All right, thank you so much for your remarks. We're going to be now moving into the Q&A session of today's presentation. So if, if any of y'all have any questions, feel free to raise your hands until I call on you. Alternatively, if you're joining us online, feel free to drop them in the Zoom Q&A feature. With that, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. That's a nice presentation. So I, was, I, I would like to see if uh, beyond the stability implication, if if adding the if your your uh, model with the uh, fiscal deficits uh, alters the dynamic property, so for instance, the impulse responses to a monetary policy shock do they look very different from what it would be if you only use sample until twenty nineteen? Um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so, uh, when the stability condition fails, we don't look at the impulse re uh, response uh, re response graph because. Um, if the stability uh, condition fails, it just means the dynamics between all those variables is just it's going to blow up. It's not stable. So um, if it fails, we don't uh, the other tests you conduct on the uh, regression, including the impulse response response function, it's not it's not reliable, and that's why I did not look at it. And when we added fiscal policy into the model, um, the stability function holds and. Uh, I did looking into the uh, impulse response function and it, the effect of fiscal policy on uh, inflation, unemployment is very uh, significant. Yeah, I think you could compare it to the, the estimated, the, using the sample before that ends before the pandemic, so you avoid the stability issues. Uh, yeah, so before the pandemic, the stability condition holds and fiscal policy is not significant. Do we have any more questions for our first presenter? Hi, um, yeah, thank, thanks also for an excellent presentation. Uh, given in the, that in the forecasting group at the Cleveland Fed, we make routine use of, of bar models of the sort you described. I was, I was particularly attentive, so, you know, good job, thanks. Um, 
Thanks very much. I did have a question, uh, like, I guess my question orientated around, I mean, you're worrying about, of course, a problem that we confront uh, routinely also that the global financial crisis and particularly the pandemic kind of disrupt, if I put it clumsily like that, the, the VAR model. And you set out, I think, a nice, nice way of perhaps a strategy to, to, to resolve that. I just wondered well, whether you'd thought about alternative solutions such as, and William's comment was kind of touching on this, that perhaps you simply dummy out you know, the, 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 the COVID period, you know, it's kind of a non-linearity perhaps, which you, you wouldn't, you don't expect your model to capture. So you just forget the data over the last couple of years and, and use the data pre-pandemic, and hopefully we are now post-pandemic to, to um, undertake analysis with your model. So yeah, I guess my question is, <laughs> to, to boil it down is, you know, if, if you thought about alternative strategies, which you might compare with yours to kind of almost as, as, uh, assess the robustness of your conclusions. Um. I think um, if I, the first uh, possible fix to the bar I thought of is the shadow funds rate because um, I think zero or lower bounds is a big issue and the unconventional monetary policies cannot be captured by the federal funds rate. And, and after including the shadow funds rate, it, the model doesn't like um, work. Um, I was uh, considering how valid is the shadow funds rate. And uh, since those are like data I get from when Shadi uh, from a paper they published in 2016. So um, I personally did not construct the shadow funds rate. I don't know how they did it, how valid are those. And but I don't, I just personally cannot uh, construct a data for shadow funds rate myself. And that's why I proposed the fiscal policy. Um, Cause I remember um, from macro classes that fiscal policy matters when the zero lower bound is binding. Um, I guess from my limited understanding of macroeconomics, um, fiscal policy is one of the things that I can think of that why the model is up. But, um, and after I added it into the model, it works. So I don't, not thinking about the other possible alternatives and I should definitely work on that. Do we have any last quick questions? We have around 45 seconds. So I, I just wanted to ask, um, have you thought about, um, how you might introduce someone else's estimate of the shadow funds rate as an instrument, perhaps? Um, so uh, the way one shall define shadow funds rate is that you will be equaling to the federal funds rate when, zero, when the zero lower bound is not binding. And when the zero lower bound is finding, they'll uh, like convert the effect of unconventional monetary policy into a summary of like interest rate. Um, I looked for other measures of like shadow funds rate, but I think those are the most outstanding ones um, in the paper. I think they, um, the paper is really influential and they have like a web page just to like summarize the shadow funds rate. Um, I did not find any other available data for measuring the shadow funds rate. All right, thank you so much for your remarks and for your wonderful presentation today. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is the fun bit where I stand and sit and stand and sit. Our next uh, lovely presenter today is coming again from Oberlin College is Hannah Chris. And to prevent everyone from hearing me try to sing the name of the title to the 1979 hit, We Are Family. Instead, it's We Don't Need No Education, Education Policy of College Educated Mayors. Please welcome Hannah to the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, as, uh, as we said, I am uh, from Oberlin College. You're really getting a full view of the Oberlin College Econ Department today. Um, uh, so uh, just a little slide overview there of what I'm going to go into. I'm going to go into some background and motivation, um, empirical strategy, and then present my results. Um, so here's my question. Uh, does electing a college-educated mayor produce better educational outcomes as compared to electing a non-college-educated mayor? Uh, right? We might expect that uh, having a college education might improve uh, a mayor's ability to uh, make and uh, enforce policy, right? if it helps them come up with more creative or innovative policies. Um, on the other hand, uh, going to college might also change or uh, reveal a different preference set of mayors um, that might encourage them to spend more money 
on education uh, in an area. Uh, so I would want to know that if there is such a difference in educational outcomes, is this being driven by better or more effective policy, or is this being driven by spending? And this matters, right? Because if it's better policy, uh, then we can elect a college-educated mayor, have better education outcomes, and there's going to be no trade-offs. But if it's a change in spending, right, that means that there's going to be some sort of trade-off, whether that's higher taxes or reduced funding in other uh, areas, other public services. So I find, uh, just to give the game away, that electing a college-educated mayor does not impact educational outcomes in a context where spending is constrained. So if there is any impact, it is being driven by spending as opposed to better policy. Um, looking at some prior literature, there's very mixed implications. Uh, in general, educational attainment is treated as a positive indicator of candidate quality. Uh, when literature looks at different laws that change the way candidate composition happens in, uh, in, an, in an election system, uh, they tend to view increasing average educational attainment as a positive outcome. Uh, but the actual uh, literature looking into whether this does create positive outcomes for uh, any sort of uh, measure is very minimal and mixed. Uh, some studies have found positive impacts of electing a college-educated politician on growth, uh, but others have found no or even negative effects. Um, and even for educational outcomes, uh, it's a little bit more positive, but still very mixed and lacking in causal uh, research. Um, and, and there's also very little ability to discern whether this education effects are coming from increased spending or improved policy. Uh, and so I'm specific, uh, focusing specifically on mayors in Brazil. Uh, this is a, uh, a good place to study this because Brazilian mayors, while they have a lot of control over education operation, they have very little control over funding. Uh, in Brazil, in an attempt to reduce educational inequality, um, federal and state authorities are responsible for funding most of uh, primary education in the country. Uh, so they're spending, the, the uh, federal and state authorities give money to the local authorities that they can then spend on education. Um, and there are these, both these guaranteed minimal levels of funding, but there are also some maximum caps specifically on personnel spending to reduce corruption. Um, and in 2011, we can see 93% of spending on public services of local interest, which would include education, um, is gonna come from intergovernmental transfers. So there's very little ability of these mayors to control spending levels. Um, Despite this lack of funding control, uh, Brazilian mayors are able to impact education quality through the use of policy uh, and, and personnel changes. So we see Akhtari et al. found that when the mayorship changes party hands, which sometimes leads to some personnel uh, changes at the school level, standardized tests, uh, in fact, uh, test scores fall. Um, and so we should expect that if more educated mayors were, in fact, more competent at setting education policy, that should show up in the data. We, we should be able to see an effect. Um, so moving into my empirical strategy, I use a close election regression discontinuity design. Uh, so the assumption here is that in very close uh, two-way elections, the uh, precise percentage of votes garnered by a particular candidate is going to be at least partially random. And so uh, cities that elect a barely elect a college educated mayor, you know, 50.1% of the vote are going to be plausibly counterfactual to cities where uh, they elected a non-college mayor by like 50.1%. Uh, and so uh, this is specifically looking at cities where the election was held between a college and a non-college candidate. To define a close election, I use a standard algorithm uh, in the literature, which uses a data-driven approach to select the optimal bandwidth. I'm not just randomly picking close elections. Uh, so here's my regression discontinuity uh, equation. Um, the key thing here is we're looking at uh, beta zero, uh, which is going to look at the causal impact uh, of electing a college educated mayor. Uh, so how am I going to measure educational outcomes? Uh, so first of all, my election data is going to be drawn from the Tribunal Superior Electoral, which is a federal body that oversees all elections in Brazil. Uh, their, their data is uh, very standard. Uh, it's it's very clean, not a lot of missing data. Brazil in particular does a very good job of data access. Uh, I have data from the 2004 through the 2016 elections. Um, and this data includes demographic info on the candidates, which includes their educational attainment. I then uh, box candidates into college or non-college, uh, depending on you know if they graduated high school or didn't graduate high school, they're gonna be non-college. If they graduated college or they made it through to post-grad education, they're gonna be college educated. I drop partially treated individuals who had some college but were not complete. Uh, they're a relatively small percentage of the sample. For my educational outcomes, I'm looking at five potential indicators. Uh, one is test scores. These are uh, standardized test scores from the uh, SIAB, which is a national standardized test score administered to uh, all Brazilian students uh, bi-yearly. 
uh, every two years. Um, and there's both math scores and Portuguese language scores for that. I look at dropout rates, uh, failure rates, uh, which is you know failing to complete a grade and move on to the next grade. Uh, IDEB scores, which are a federal government assigned measure of school quality. It's itself an index score. Um, I also look at class sizes. So how many students are there per uh, educator? Uh, the breadth of indicators allows me to uh, pick up on the possibility that any one indicator might not completely pick up these effects, right? There's a lot of uh, discussion about what constitutes better education. So I'm taking a very broad approach trying to see if there's any improvement in, in any of these possible outcomes. Uh, for each indicator, I look at the change across a mayoral term. I look at the uh, indicator in the first year of the mayoral term, uh, as well as the last year in a mayoral term. So a couple of validity tests just to test whether regression discontinuity design is appropriate here. I do some balance tests. Um, we're saying, right, that non-college and college educated mayor or cities with non-college and college educated mayors with very close elections are going to be plausibly counterfactual. And we can see for a variety of controls, there's really no difference uh, across those uh, control variables, as we should expect. Um, I also look to see if there's a manipulation test, if there's any bunching around the 50% uh, voting threshold. Uh, if there was, that would probably be a way more interesting paper. Um, but thankfully, uh, there does not appear to be so. Um, so looking at my regression results, regression discontinuity, I always think graphs are the best way to show regression discontinuity results. Uh, first of all, I, I said, right, that Brazilian mayors cannot change educational spending. We should test whether that's true. Um, and so I test if there is any uh, difference in education spending versus, for college versus non-college mayors. As you can see, very flat, no significant effects. Uh, you can see that in the table as well. Uh, then I look at math test scores. Again, very flat uh, across all three uh, uh, outcome variables there, um, along with Portuguese test scores. Again, very flat. You can also see there's going to be like equally uh, an equal number of positive versus negative um, uh, estimates here, and the estimates are all going to be very close to zero, uh, implying that there's probably no effect here. Uh, same with dropout rates, uh, same story. Uh, everything is very flat. Um, there's, uh, in my regression, I didn't have a single significant uh, result. IDEB scores as well, uh, we can see the same thing, and as well as elementary class sizes and early education class sizes. So really not significant at all, um, no significant results. So what can I rule out, right? If we get a null effect, you know, is that really just uh, that, there, is that picking up a true zero or is it just that I can't pick up the effect? And so in general, my standard errors are a little bit too large to rule out meaningful effects. Um, but I, I, I take heart in the fact that um, I, you know, I'm doing a lot of regressions here and they are very much centered around zero. None of them are significant. They're very close to zero. I have uh, some positive and negative uh, uh, estimates, uh, which gives me hope that this is more likely to be a, a true zero effect rather than just uh, a lack of power. Uh, and so I find, uh, just to summarize, I find no difference uh, in education spending in municipalities with a college educated mayor versus those with a non-college uh, mayor, which is as we should expect. Um, but more importantly, I also find that uh, municipalities with a college educated mayor have no better outcomes than those with a non-college mayor, uh, including across several alternative uh, specifications and robustness tests. Um, and by the, I also find that they remain null if I only consider areas uh, or cities where the uh, mayor's educational attainment changed across an election. So they went from a non-college to a college mayor or from a college to a non-college mayor. Um, and so as a result, I can conclude that electing a college educated mayor has no effect on education outcomes. Uh, and I think this has serious implications about how uh, citizens should evaluate their mayoral candidates. Um, since uh, mayors can't really have an effect here, um, any benefits are gonna be uh, at a cost of reduced spending in other areas or increased taxes. Uh, a couple limitations. Time has unfortunately elapsed. Thank you. You want to get like one last sentence out? I'll just give one last sentence, uh, which is I think there's a lot of areas for further research, including looking at uh, education beyond primary education, uh, like college or secondary school education, as well as government beyond local government, like uh, state or federal authorities. So thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause, please. All I have to say is there goes my dreams of becoming a mayor of a great American city and then not improving the education system. Uh, we are gonna be now moving on to Adam, who's gonna be giving us uh, the, discuss uh, gonna be discussing uh, today's presentation. Whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away.
Awesome. So firstly, I'd like to take the chance to thank the author for bringing this new and fascinating research subject to light. And I'd like to start by giving my perspective on the main objective of the author's research, which is to try and identify new indicators that can help track trends in education levels in a given area. My understanding was that the ultimate goal is to find indicators that correlate to increases in education levels, which only leads to benefits, such as a decrease in poverty in a developing country. Also, another motivation behind the research was to provide a framework for developing countries, like the one studied in the case, to aid them in becoming developed countries more quickly. I appreciate how the author adds new data and provides their own spit on the subject, which is a counter argument to what was previously believed. The author used the education level of the mayor as the indicator in this case, which unfortunately did not prove to be fruitful. However, it provides us with a framework for future studies. The author employed a close election regression discontinuity design to evaluate the effect of elections on educational policies. To make sure everyone is on the same page about this regression, it is a method used to study the causal effect of an election on policies or outcomes. This approach is based on the idea that in a close election, the winning candidate is determined by a random element beyond their control, such as a few extra votes. Therefore, this random element can be considered a natural experiment that creates a discontinuity in the probability of winning between either candidate. By comparing the outcomes of the candidates who narrowly won or lost, researchers can estimate the causal effect of the election on policies or outcomes. This design attempts to minimize potential biases and the attention to detail when determining the different municipalities and elections to include in the model attests to the strength of the study. As a suggestion, I would like to make note that if there was more data readily available to be added to the regression model, there could be more accurate and predictive results. I will, however, concede that obtaining data that would fit this exact model could prove to be quite difficult as there are various criteria that must align to be consistent with the framework. I think this model is a great base to begin with to expand on in the future. Another way to expand on this research could be to survey the populations of different municipalities that were analyzed. Analyzing voter decision-making in conjunction with viewing the trends of the data from afar could, be, could prove fruitful. Gaining insight into the deciding factors of the close elections could provide an unforeseen breakthrough to explain and add even more layering to the model. To conclude, the niche topic of analysis in this research has great potential, in my opinion. The study provides valuable insights into how education can or cannot be an indicator for improved education across the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much for those remarks. Yeah, we'll have a little applause for them as well. <laughs> we're gonna we're now gonna be moving into the Q and A portion of our second presentation. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Over in the back. Hi, Hannah. Uh, apologies, I kind of came in a little late, so this may have been already discussed or, or, or talked about, but how much should I even be thinking about mayors, though, even from a theoretical standpoint, actually affecting educational outcomes? Because at least in the United States, and you know, we're comparing to different countries here, we have you know, state boards of education, we have then district boards of education, which are then open elections, both within the state and then for the individual districts. And I would think, at least if you're trying to extend this to like the, considering the United States, that that would have more of an effect in terms of how educated Board of Education members are than mayors. Because at least in my experience, right, so this is entirely anecdotal, but mayors in the U.S. tend to have very little effect on actual any, anything in regards to education in their in their cities. Uh, excellent question. Um, uh, I want to point out that, so I'm, right, I'm studying in Brazil, and one thing to point out is, first of all, Brazilian mayors are a little bit stronger than their um, American counterparts, uh, partially because um, while I, I'm talking about these municipalities, um, municipalities in Brazil are a little bit more like metro areas or even maybe counties uh, rather than in America where we have like might have very, very small cities. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is I think largely this is a question where we can look to data to see, well, do mayors actually have an effect? Um, and uh, one paper that I read uh, looked at when Brazilian mayors change party hands, right? So when it, they go from one party to another using a fairly similar uh, methodology as I employed, um, when this happens, right, personnel changes happen at schools. Uh, and as a result, they, uh, the paper found that uh, test scores actually did significantly fall 
Uh, and so that tells me that if there is a real effect here, it should be, uh, I should be able to pick, pick it up in the data that these mayors are actually having um, uh, severe or sincere effects on education policy, particularly uh, because they can do things like set personnel uh, decisions, like they appoint the headmaster, for example, um, and they can uh, do a little bit more with policy than American mayors can. But it is a very good point that um, my study may not be generalizable to other areas that have different political systems. We have right over there. Your last comment raises the possibility that perhaps you want to look at whether or not an edu education matters in, is not a change. Changing party is changing education. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, two things. One is that um, one problem, and I came up with this in my, or I encountered this problem when I did my heterogeneity analysis looking at just uh, municipalities where uh, the educational attainment changed. Uh, you obviously, you kind of reduce your sample size fairly significantly when you do those uh, heterogeneity tests. Also uh, in Brazil, in America, we tend to think of education as being very politically polarized, right? There's sort of a, a significant education polarization. It's a little bit less true in Brazil. Um, Party membership is not really predicted very well by education in Brazil. Um, did a couple tests on this. Uh, and part of that is just they have slightly different um, approaches to the political system. We have a virtual question. Okay, so I'm going to be the voice of the virtual question. So the virtual, through the Q&A we got, I think this was an excellent presentation and I really appreciated how you incorporated visualizations for the results section instead of solely regression tables. Could you talk a little more about the data limitations? Did you feel that it was, that it was a big limitation? And if so, would you recommend other researchers work on attaining um, perhaps a larger data set? Or would you think a more theoretical and less empirical, empirical approach might work well here? Uh, well, I, uh, a couple of different ways to approach this. I think, so I use a close election regression discontinuity design. And of course the, uh, you know, the trade-off there is every micro researcher, I think you know, the bane of every micro uh, econ researcher is that you, the trade-off here is, you know, you get, so I think pretty plausible causal estimates but at the cost of really looking at fairly small sample sizes, right? If you're only considering the uh, elections that are close elections, you're gonna have, uh, you know, you're giving up a lot of data in, uh, in that regard. Uh, but I would point out, I actually did, I had a fairly significant data set. This wasn't like, I, I'm only looking at a couple hundred elections. Um, I, I had a fairly large data set. Uh, I don't think the data limitations are so extreme as to negate my results, for example. But I do think that this calls for uh, the benefit of breadth of research, of, of asking these questions using different methodologies, um, whether that's just different micro econometric methodologies, or uh, as the questioner said, approaching this from a more theoretical lens. I think there's a lot of opportunity for other researchers to pick up where I left off and see if my results continue to hold across those different applications. All right, let's give Hannah one last uh, round of applause for an amazing presentation. And this is more for uh, my friends in the room who go to CWRU. Fun fact, I spent about one eighth of my life teaching in one form or another. So that had a bit close to home. Our last and final presenter today is not from Oberlin, is actually from the University of Akron. We're going south here, folks, but like in a good south, not like that. Anyways, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I tried to come up with a bit of a pun for this title when I was on the bus this morning, but I couldn't find any, so congratulations. Uh, we're, uh, Carissa Chen, a senior at the University of Akron, will be discussing with us today effect of membership programs on individual giving to nonprofits. So feel free to take it away. Hi, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So again, my name is Carissa, and I'm from the University of Akron. I'm going to present to you my results on the effect of membership programs on charitable giving. So to give you a little bit of background, we have to talk about the importance of nonprofits in the economy. In 2016, nonprofits contributed 5.6% of national GDP. And furthermore, arts and culture-based nonprofits specifically generated $27.5 in revenue. Multiply that by how many different nonprofit industries there are, it gives you a pretty uh, good idea of how significant they are. To nonprofits, they receive 75% of their operating income from individuals. And so that's just a testament of how important soliciting individual donors is to nonprofits operations, which is kind of what gathered me to start asking 
what effect do membership programs have on the yearly to total donations that an organization receives? And I used my position with Akron Nonprofit, the Akron Civic Theater, to compile the database, which I will be using in the analysis. To give a little bit of a literature review, um, loyalty programs in the for-profit, loyalty programs are not, the literature is not as well-developed in nonprofits as it is in for-profits. Um, but given the effect of loyalty programs in the for-profit sector, we can also kind of hypothesize that it would also have a positive effect in the not-for-profit sector. Also, the effect of a prioritization strategy on relationship factors in fundraising. Um, this article showed that having different levels of inclusion, so different options that people can give at, would foster a greater sense of loyalty to the organization. But this doesn't really talk about the specific donation amount that people are willing to give. And then lastly, building loyalty and trust in the organization increases the likelihood of the quests or those large scale gifts that nonprofits are often aiming towards in the future. Um, to summarize, Building loyalty builds trust with the individual, which fosters commitment to the organization and eventually gets to that fiscal long-term gift that uh, nonprofits are ultimately looking for. And my contribution is to quantify the monetary effects of a prioritization strategy. So the membership program does have different tiered levels of giving, um, which does fall into that kind of category. And it's to ultimately provide further reference for how loyalty programs can affect nonprofit organizations, individual giving revenue, and influence uh, nonprofit development strategies. The theory behind motivational giving can be branched into two different categories. So it, some argue that it is a public good, but when arguing it's a public good, um, you can get that free rider effect where um, those that don't donate will still get the same benefit by those that do donate. So why would they donate if they're getting the same effect? Um, so I'm gonna go along the lines of that individual giving is a private good and it can be further divided between extrinsic and intrinsic motivations. Um, extrinsic motivations are very outcome oriented. So it's saying that donors donate for the sake of the benefit of the organization or the people that they're helping. And that intrinsic theory is that internal feel good. There's a warm glow theory that was coined by Adriani in 1989 um, that supports that people donate for the sake of that internal feeling that they feel good by helping others. For my data section, it was a raw sample of 900 or 858 59 individual donors. Um, they had to have given between January of 2016 and December of 2022. The only removable edits I made was they had to have made at least one donation for my method to work, which I will continue in the next section. Um, ultimately, I had a final sample of 450 donors. And the only other additional edit I will note is that I renamed the yearly cycle to be November 1st to October 31st, which is when the program started taking place. Let's talk about some summary statistics. So I added some control variables to my model and it they were all measures of donation habits. So propensity measured how much a donor gives to nonprofits as a whole. Affinity measures how likely a donator will give to this type of organization specifically. So arts and culture organizations in this case. And then capacity uh, measures a donor's level of wealth. Um, you can see here that the total sample size of average donation amount is around $500 um, total for the year. And that is gonna kind of contribute to how effective the, um, how significant the results will be. Uh, this graphic is a demonstration of year and total gifts received. So going back five years of data, so from 2017 to 2022, one thing to note is that the organization did undergo a significant capital campaign between 2018 and 2020. Um, and then the program starts in November of 2021. And which is already kind of nice to see is that um, the sample is kind of branching off. So that does visually indicate that there is a little bit of an effect um, that the program has between the treatment and control groups. Let's talk about my methodology. I used a difference in difference method or the difference in difference approach to create three different models. The second model that you see up top there is the simple method that includes control variables. And my first model just negated the control variables. Um, just as a reminder, the control variables were control variables were propensity, affinity, and capacity. 
And then I did a two-way fixed effect difference in difference model to account for time and um, donor account fixed effects. So member is the indicator equal to one if the entity is a member. And then the after variable was equal to one if the observation takes place after 2021. And then ultimately we're trying to find out the total year end received amount and how these affect it. So in order for the difference in difference method to be arguable, we had to determine that had the treatment never taken place, these effects would, had the treatment never taken place, the control and treatment groups would have had the same behavior prior to the treatment. Um, so I ran a parallel trends test and balance of aggressors test to test for this. And in summary, they were statistically similar. So both groups, we can argue that both groups would have behaved similarly had the treatment never taken place. Um, that's evidenced by the low significant values um, since the control variable means are statistically similar between both groups. The results ultimately determined that the membership program decreased year end total donations by $163, more so than those that did not sign up. So that's like a 34% reduction, which is kind of interesting. Um, here's the results of my analysis. Uh, again, it's a low significance and a high standard error. So I imagine I attribute that to a lot of um, issues with the data, which I will continue on with with my conclusions. go here. So why would decreasing donate or why would the membership program decrease donations? One possible reason is that substituting, substituting giving through the program, um, when the program was initially launched, donors that were approached with this program may not have been interested in adopting the membership, but instead sent in just a philanthropic do donation in place of the membership for the benefits. Um, does the conclusion indicate that nonprofits should avoid membership programs? No, that's silly, but <laughs> it does go against the intrinsic giving theory in favor of extrinsic theories. Um, it implies that individuals are not inclined to donate for their personal benefit, which I think has significant implications for development strategists. If donors aren't donating for their personal benefit, whatever um, physical benefits they receive, but they're just donating for their internal well-being, that's, um, it just means for less fiscal cost for the um, program to run or try to solicit these donors. Further research, the biggest part is how will the results change with more data? So the results were on a scale of January, 2016, the program took place in 2021, and now we are in 2023. So I just have a year's worth of post-program data, but say let's go down five years down the line, obviously more data will create richer results. Um, and also do membership programs increase the likelihood of making a large scale gift in the future? So let's assume that the results do remain the same and that the membership program does decrease donations. Um, that's not to say that the efforts to soliciting loyalty would not result in a ultimate return on investment in the future. And I think that that's gonna be my conclusion. So thank you guys very much. Let's give a round of applause, please. That was absolutely phenomenal. Next up is our discussant, Adam, who will be uh, taking away for us. Awesome. So. Once again, I'd like to start by thanking the author of this paper for putting really great effort into bringing an undervalued subject to light. And the motivation behind the study is to provide nonprofit organizations with new data from tried and tested methods used by for-profit organizations, as in membership programs, as you mentioned, to try and generate more funds. And the study is backed by evidence from a nonprofit organization, the Akron Civic Theater, that recently employed a membership program in uh, November 2021. And uh, we begin with the introduction, which highlights the importance of the nonprofit sector, which is an underappreciated subject, in my opinion, and how it contributes to GDP. It amounted to 5.6% of overall US GDP in 2016. And this tells us that they need reliable revenue to keep up with their competition. Uh, the literature review suggests that information exchange between members and the, MP, uh, the nonprofit organization can help align the beliefs and ideologies to better serve the members when they sign up. 
and having the quote unquote levels of donations leads to more loyalty and cultural organizations with a prioritization strategy outperform organizations that treat their donors equally. It was also noted that the specific donation amount requests from the nonprofit can lead to a higher propensity to donate. The data overview section analyzes data from 450 accounts. I think this area might have been a bit unclear, but 106 of those became members after the membership program was established. And all the accounts considered in the study, regardless of membership status, had more than one donation before the membership program was created. And I'd like to take the chance to appreciate the attention to detail set forth by the author to have the most representative and accurate data points as possible. And the data table used in the paper measures propensity to donate, capacity of donation, and affinity scaled on levels from one to four, as mentioned by the presenter. And these numbers were used to inform the final results. And the methodology used in the study is a mouthful, first of all, but is also a two-way fixed effect difference in differences method. And this method is called difference in differences because it involves taking the difference in changes in the outcome variable between the treatment and control groups before and after the intervention. And in our scenario, the intervention is the membership that was established in November 2021. And by comparing these differences, the difference in differences method can estimate the causal effect of the intervention on the outcome variable. And the study utilizes data from 2016 to 2022, with the treatment group being accounts that became members after the proposed yearly date that our presenter mentioned from November 2021. And the control group was the accounts that did not become members. And this design allows for a comparison between the control and treatment group that provides insight into how the membership program influenced the donations. So I'm curious to see what other organizations results would look like for the same exact test. As, as mentioned by the presenter, I think further down the line, maybe in five years, seeing how the Akron Civic Theater turned out would also be interesting. But I think to kind of branch out a little bit more, we could test other organizations. And with more data, I think the conclusions would be much more indicative of the main point the author is after. And I'm excited to see the finished paper once the study is completely finished. So to conclude, the study aims to fill a gap in the literature on membership programs and nonprofit organizations and helps provide insight into better fundraising methods. The goal is to have these research findings to help nonprofit organizations so they better serve their members and achieve their fundraising goals. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for your lovely remarks. We're dealing with technology issues right now. Uh, the Q&A time. If anyone has any questions here in the room, uh, feel free to raise your hand. And if not, uh, ask them in the Q&A portion of the Zoom application. Um, did the people self-select into the membership programs or like, how did that work? Yes, so there is a chance of biases in that regard um, because the way that the program was launched out, it was just the usual pamphlet. We have this new membership program. Um, we would like you to join it. So there was a decision aspect to those. I got my mic back, Anna. <laughs> Um, I have a quick question. So the revenue gained from the membership, did that go towards the same like funding as if you gave a philanthropy, like a gift at the end of the year? Like would that money go towards the same? Yeah, so all the money goes towards one, one pot. And there is um, essential, the only difference between making a philanthropic do donation versus making a donation to the membership program is the benefits that you receive. And then the percentage of tax deductible um, would be a little different because there are additional benefits. Um, yeah, that is your question. Do we have any more uh, questions? Over in the back. Um, so lovely talk and good discussion too, um, Adam. Now, Maybe I was misunderstanding the nature of your data. Um, as I understood it, you're looking at the effects of membership on donations, but it's for a theatre group, right? For a, for a theatre mm -hmm. that you're involved with? Yeah. Um, I mean, presumably members are also more likely, one might hypothesise, to more frequently buy tickets for the theatre, indeed buy more expensive seats at the, at the, at the theatre. So I wondered if you'd look at, looked at that effect, or indeed whether the data exists first off, or, if, if it does exist, whether that might be another way in which memberships affecting the kind of 
the overall, overall revenues of the, of the theatre. I would have loved to look into the, um, I guess, more qualitative effect of the membership program, which I think is definitely an area of further research. Um, so my data did specifically focus in on the donation amounts, and it did not account for the actual revenue that the theater gets in from ticket donations. So this is um, purely donations that um, individuals would give in, and the membership program does include things like voucher uses, so get two free vouchers to his shows. And so in that respect, it does get them into the theater, which could have the effect of what you're implying that um, being into the theater more often makes them more attached to it and willing to come to more shows. Do we have any final questions? All right, I mean, I'm not gonna be the one to stand in the way of lunch. So let's thank Carissa, a, give Carissa thank a you. massive round of applause, please. And as I alluded to earlier, next is lunch, so I'll keep this quick. Uh, let's give all three of our lovely presenters a round of applause in addition to our discussant who is joining us virtually. We learned about a lot today, ranging from a theater in Akron all the way up to uh, macroeconomic policy regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. So a bit of a whirlwind, but I had a ton of fun. Thank you so much for joining me and us today here at the Federal Reserve and for putting up with whatever weird jokes I came up with, sometimes on the spot, sometimes not. 